speaker. Um, Raggy Kuchikar uh, is one of our nation's very best medical oncologists. Um, she trained at uh, Emory uh, University where she did her medical training and then went on to the University of Colorado where she did uh, medical oncology. But more importantly, she really focused her career at that point in time on melanoma uh, under the mentorship of Renee Gonzalez and Carl Lewis. From there, she went to the Moffitt Cancer Institute where she worked very closely with Jeff Weber and Vern Sondak uh, and was one of the first uh, in our country to work with uh, particularly the, the PD-1 inhibitor class of molecules and the targeted therapeutics. Um, and she did this at a very early phase in her career. She's now come home and she's back in Atlanta. Uh, there she is uh, part of a team of doctors that are caring for President Carter. And uh, she continues to be one of our uh, true thought leaders in caring for advanced melanoma. Um, so I'd just like to wel welcome Raggy. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Your city is gorgeous. This is my first time in Salt Lake. And it, it really miss me, makes me miss the West because it's just so gorgeous out here. And I want to start by saying, how important these organizations like AIM, these patient symposiums are. And I'm gonna tell a little bit of a personal story of why they're so important. So a patient of mine who I just saw back in clinic last week came to see me in 2009 for one of the phase one, it was before we really knew anything about nivolumab, the, one of the PD-1 drugs. And it wasn't in the press, it wasn't in the news, and he flew from Philadelphia, I was in Tampa, Florida at the time, to see me and enroll on this phase one trial in Tampa every two weeks, lived with his ex-wife's parents to do this trial. So just a market, and I finally said to him one day, how did you know, why did you fly, why did you do all this, you know, in a time where, where none of these drugs were on anyone's radar, at least in the, in the media, in the press? And he said, you know what, I was in Philly and I went to a patient symposium. And he was like, it was a rough day, I just found out I had metastatic melanoma, and I found out about this at the last minute, I showed up late and I caught the tail end of a talk. And someone said something about PD-1, and it's what I got from the talk. And I went home, and I looked for it, and I looked for trials, and I found your institution, and I came to see you. So that was about 2009, and that all stemmed from a patient symposium. So, and I saw him last week, he's doing well, he's running zip lines in North Carolina, so he's clearly doing very well. And it's just a testament, one, to what you guys do to educate yourselves and how important these symposiums are and how even if it just changed one person's life, you know, it's well worth it. So thank you for having me. So I'm going to talk about uh, some of the immune therapeutics that are out there and hopefully try to go over some of the terminology we use. I heard someone say this morning, you know, we do a lot of doctor speak. It's how we make ourselves feel smart and important. Um, but the reality is, is we have to break that down. So hopefully I will break down some of the terminology we're using a lot um, and talk about how these drugs work and some of the side effects. And the end of my talk, to answer your question, are going to be really a series of really the major questions in melanoma that my patients give to me every single day. So I tried to go over what my patients have asked me in clinic about these drugs and hopefully be able to answer some of those questions for you. Granted, there's not an hour of time or more to answer all the questions, but hopefully I'll give you the most common ones that at least my patients ask me. So just some of the ter terminology. First of all, immune therapy. So immune therapy is just anything that stimulates your own immune system, which we use the term innate to find your own, um, to get your own immune system to kill cancer cells. The reason I put that in there, all of you have melanoma probably reading a lot about immune therapy, but it gets confused a lot. Well, well what about chemo? Why aren't you talking about chemo? What is chemotherapy? Is immune therapy a chemotherapy? And I say for an oncologist, we get really specific. We define chemotherapy as chemicals that kill growing dividing cells. So immune therapy is a little different. But I think in most people's language, chemotherapy is just anything against cancer. And so the reality is, is when we're in clinic, we try to be more specific, mainly because 
chemotherapy gives people a vision of hair loss and vomiting. And though our immune therapies have side effects, it's typically not hair loss and vomiting. So we like to be more specific. I would say when you're talking with your friends or your family or even people online, a lot of time people will just use the term chemotherapy to refer to anything against cancer. The term checkpoint inhibitors are used a lot um, to refer to all our drugs that essentially block proteins. So in your immune cell, your T cell, there are different proteins that kind of tell a stop, go kind of area in our immune system. It's kind of like the switches Dr. Grossman was talking about before. So they keep the immune system in check from getting way too stimulated. And so all these new drugs we'll be talking about, the ipilimumab, nivolumab, the all these drugs are called checkpoint inhibitors because they block one of those switches. So antibodies um, are, can be natural things in your body that, that fight or bind to antigens or proteins or chemicals or any of those things. But it can also be synthetic. So it can be made from mice. It can be made from humans. So a lot of these quote unquote checkpoint inhibitors are actually antibodies that have been humanized, and that's why a lot of people don't have allergic reactions, um, and that bind to a checkpoint on your T cells. So those are the Y-shaped things, and they're designed, and they look like that, and those are antibodies. Uh, the other term sometimes used is immune modulators. Those are some of our other drugs, like interferon, and those are proteins that kind of regulate the activity. So how much gas is on the cells or and things like that. So it's what the gas is. I feel like I'm trying to define things, and I'm just using more confusing words. So I apologize <laughs> for that. Oh, I don't know how confusing I'm getting. But cancer vaccines are, are talked about. I think they're a lot in the media. They just use a portion of a tumor cell to try to get your immune system to recognize it kind of like your flu vaccine has a portion of the flu that's not active, but if we can get that, those memory cells invoked, can we help it? Um, adopted cell transfer is another form of therapy. That's actually the picture up top where we actually take tumor and we, we know there's immune cells in the tumor and they grow immune cells on a, in a lab and they infuse those back to treatment, to a patient to treat the cancer, to hopefully have a more robust immune response. So it's basically the act of transferring cells from a lab into a patient. And just T cells, I probably should have started that with T cells because we've been talking about T cells all morning. T actually just stands for thymus because these cells originate in the thymus. Um, and they're just part of your immune system. And they're part of your immune system that fights viruses, that fight cancer. Um, and they use the term cell-mediated response, which means just T cells fighting other cells that are supposed to be not in your body. Um, the term TIL you might see sometimes. TIL is just those... Um, lymphocytes or T cells that are in your tumor already, so tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And honestly, it's the discovery of these that really, I think, years and years ago or decades ago, people realized that the immune system is very essential to fighting melanoma because we can already see your immune system trying to fight it, even if it's not completely doing the task. Um, we talk a lot about autoimmune or autoimmunity, and that just means that your immune system is attacking something it shouldn't. It's attacking something that's yours, like your skin or your um, gut, and it's causing a side effect. So some people can have autoimmunity from the drugs we're giving. Some people can have natural, like rheumatoid arthritis, which is thought to be um, people's immune system attacking their joints. So there are other diseases that occur that cause that. So your immune cells attacking yourself. Another important topic in melanoma are the term, is the term biomarker. Biomarker is an indicator, basically, of something. So there's a lot of biomarkers for response. So PDL1 is probably the most common that's talked about. And that is saying, can I use this to determine whether a drug will work? 
There's other types of biomarkers which are trying to determine how aggressive a cancer is. So they can um, say that, well, I can tell you your cancer will be more aggressive or less aggressive, but it doesn't necessarily say how well the drugs will work. So there's kind of a couple of types of biomarkers. It's a big area of research in melanoma because what we all want to do and kind of a theme towards today is really find that holy grail of biomarker where I can just take your blood and say, yes, you're going to respond to this drug, and there won't be all this decision-making that's going on. So um, those are just some of the terms that I think come up a lot when I talk about immune therapy and melanoma. Um, but the other set of terms are drug terminology because every drug has like three names and we just, everyone uses a different one and it gets very confusing in my mind of who's talking about what. So I'm going to talk mainly about the drugs that uh, are most commonly used and are approved for melanoma in the immune therapy realm. So ipilimumab was the first to be approved and I don't know who invented these names, but they're all horrendous. Sorry to if BMS is here, but um, Yervoy is the brand name, and I tend to call it Ippy for short because that's just a mouthful. And all of these things are the same thing, and they're all monoclonal antibodies. So they're all these Y-shaped things that bind to a portion of a T cell. So nivolumab is a PD-1 antibody, and we'll talk about what that is. Um, Opdivo is the brand name, Nevo for short, uh, is what I use, and those are all three the same thing. So pembrolizumab, I actually forgot to put, so pembrolizumab used to be called lambrolizumab, so if you look at the original article, but apparently that's very similar to another drug that's not a cancer drug, so the FDA thought those drugs would get confused, so made them change their name, and so that's why You'll hear the lambrolizumab in some of the earlier studies, but in general, it's been fully replaced by the, the word pembrolizumab, which is brand name is Keytruda, which I call Pembro, because when I was a resident, I was never allowed to say brand name. So until I got into seeing patients and patients were like, what are you talking about? I was like, oh, I need to somehow figure out what the brand name of these things are. So um, all the same thing. Uh, there's the combination treatment of ipilimumab and nivolumab, so usually I'll abbreviate ipinevo. Um, some people call it the regimen I've heard. I've heard combination. That's typically what people are talking about is the combination of both drugs given together. These are some other immune therapies that are on the market. I'm not going to talk about them in detail, but interferon it's abbreviated IFN, and it's intron A. There's something called Xylotron, which is a pegylated interferon, meaning a long-acting interferon. We talked a lot about TVEC, and I'm going to have to have Dr. Grossman say the actual name because I can't pronounce that one. Um, Emlygic is the brand name. And another immune therapy called high-dose interleukin-2 is proleukin and aldosleukin I'm like, uh, I haven't said that in a long time. Anyways, high-dose IL-2, all the same thing. And so I don't know why we make it so hard on ourselves in creating so many different names. But hopefully this, when we're talking throughout about these drugs, it gives you a little, if I use words interchangeably. So to start with IPI, um, it's kind of what I describe as taking off the brakes. So Normally, in our bodies, we have T cells that are trying to go out, fight viruses, fight cancer. There's another immune cells that takes whatever it is, the virus, the cancer, and tries to show it to this T cell. So it's called an antigen-presenting cell. And so it takes a portion of it and tries to get your T cell to respond. In order to do that, it has to kind of bind two areas. And so that gets the immune system all rolling. And what happens is when the T cells get turned on, this molecule called CTLA-4 goes to the surface and turns it off. And it's so that you can fight the virus, whatever it is, get rid of it, and then go back to normal. But as uh, Dr. Grossman talked about earlier, people discovered that you could create a monoclonal antibody, an antibody, IPI, to block that. So basically, you're just cutting the break. And what this is allows is so your T cell can turn on again and keep fighting 
what it's trying to fight. So, so that's kind of how IPI works, is, is just blocking those breaks so your T cells can remain on. So both nivolumab and pembrolizumab work in a little different way. It's kind of the flip side of the picture. And that's kind of refueling your own T cells. So your tumor cells are actually pretty darn smart, unfortunately. And they figure out a way to, they, they don't want the T cells to be there, they want to grow. And so something called PDL1 is a marker on tumors that bind to our immune cells and kind of create this exhaust. It basically is creating a hole and the gas is not there anymore. So these are T cells that are there, they're just not working because they don't have enough gas. And so what we do is we created an antibody towards this PD-1 site. So you may hear them called PD-1 <coughs> antibodies. And they just refuel the gas. So your gas, I guess I should block that. I don't get money from BMW, nor do, have they given me a car. But um, I think I got this from Dr. Sondak, I think, who does have one. <laughs> Anyways, but um, we refuel the gas and the T cells are now on. So they're both working ultimately to get those T cells revved up, but they're just working on two different sides of it. So guess what? When we rev up the immune system and cut off all these breaks and refuel the gas, we create problems, right? There was a reason all these breaks were there to begin with. And those problems is what we refer to as immune-related adverse events, which the short term is side effects. And they're just side effects that are caused by our immune system instead of side effects caused by chemicals, which are like chemotherapy causes hair loss because the chemicals just killed them. So it's just really just side effects in general, which um, we refer to as this. So really all side effects, all these immune-related side effects can occur with any of these drugs. So given by themselves, given in combination, they can occur, they just all kind of occur at different rates. And when we get some of the severe ones, we have to use things to downplay our immune system in order to treat it. And those are typically use of steroids, um, like prednisone, or prednisone's probably the most commonly one used. And so that's the difference between this and like chemotherapy side effects. Chemo, if I just stop the chemo, your symptoms will go away. Your hair will grow back, your nausea will go away. But if we just stop these immune drugs, your immune system's still there and it's still revved up. So we have to do something to combat it, typically with steroids to combat some of the side effects. So these are just the rates of, you know, the combination definitely has a higher rate of these immune side effects than IPI by itself or any of the PD-1s by itself. And we see multiple side effects more often when you do the combination. Um, and I'll go through some of that. And again, the treatments are primarily the steroids, the prednisone. There are people that get the steroids and their immune system is so revved up, that's just not enough. We sometimes use a drug called infliximab or Remicade or Celcept or mycoflinolate. These are drugs that, again, try to bring your immune system back to normal. And what I say in the treatment is everyone gets scared. Every, no one wants, we want our immune system to be turned on. Why are you giving me drugs to turn it back off? And how I kind of describe it is, as I say, usually what we want to do is create the immune systems here and we want to make it go here, but all of a sudden we've created side effects, so we're way over here. And from our experience, at least thus far, even when we use all these drugs, like the prednisone, to tell to downregulate your immune system, we probably just go back to somewhere in the middle. Because what it looks like is a lot of these patients still get their anti-cancer benefit, even though they've had the side effects, which is good news. And it also speaks to the combination, which has a fair amount of side effects that people have to stop treatment for, yet we still see people having ongoing anti-cancer response. So the better thing is, is to make sure these side effects don't get out of control, where you're having worse effects from the side effects than you do from the cancer itself. So basically, these side effects from any of these drugs are autoimmune. So they are attacking a different organ in the body. So the gut leads to colitis, which is diarrhea. 
When you attack the skin, you can either get an itchy rash that we call dermatitis, or some people get something called vitiligo, which is where um, you get white patches in the skin, meaning that your cells aren't tanning anymore, aren't producing pigment. So it's like what Michael Jackson had, where his skin got fair. And that's actually been a long-term positive thing in melanoma when we see that. It's like your immune system is clearly trying to fight cells that look like melanoma, and those melanocytes, those pigment-producing cells in your skin, look a lot like melanoma. And so even from the original interferon studies, we've seen that people that develop this actually do quite well from a cancer standpoint. If you attack the lung, you get something called pneumonitis. For you guys, you would feel shortness of breath or cough. There's a pituitary gland that controls all these hormones in your body. It controls your thyroid. It controls just, just normal steroid. It controls testosterone for men. Um, and it can attack that. And that can be a permanent side effect of some of these drugs because we can replace all those hormones with pills. But for most people, that will be an ongoing, um, you'll require those pills for the rest of your life. Same thing with thyroid. If it attacks the thyroid, you can get too much and have too much thyroid in your system, or you can get too little um, and require to be on a pill for thyroid hormone. These are last two things are very rare, but they've been seen, and that's attacking cells in your pancreas that produce insulin. So when it does that, you create diabetes. Um, and you can attack your nerves in your body and create these syndromes that lead to weakness or numbness and tingling in your hands or feet. So though those are very rare, even with combination treatments, I think some of these are, are pretty serious. So, so it's important to be aware that they can occur. So I'm going to kind of switch gears now and go over all the questions my patient asks me and my way off on time. You'll have to keep me up. I tend to do a lot of talking. OK. Um, so the first question that came up is a question I get I asked a lot, which is, can a stage 4 melanoma patient, so someone with melanoma in the lungs, liver, somewhere else in their body, get cured of melanoma? I say, I say ultimately, the broad answer is probably yes. It's not for as many people as we'd like. And it also means something different to everyone. A cure for a 20-year-old is a lot harder than a cure for a 90-year-old, right? Because they're looking at two different goals in their life and a different amount of years. And what's really hard about the term cure is I essentially don't know anyone's cured till you die of your heart attack, stroke, or whatever we all go from. And so it's, sometimes it's really hard for us to use the term cure. I often will use the term long-term survivor. So. Long term, it depends on how long the drugs have been around, how long I know. Um, I say with high dose IL-2, which has been around for a fair amount of time, they have about 15, 20 years of follow-up. And about 5% of those people are still alive. And these are people treated in the 1990s with stage 4 melanoma. So are they cured? Are they long-term survivors? They're probably cured, this 5% of people, but it's a really tiny percentage of people. When IPI developed, the long-term survivor, from what we know, is at least 10 years of data that there's about 15 to 20% that are alive and doing well even 10 years after getting the drug. The interesting part about that is if you look at three years, those people that are doing well at three years tend to also be doing well at 10 years. So it seems that this is something that happens early on. I think we're moving the bar, which is a bar that's been shown in multiple slides. So, you know, PD-1 antibodies, we probably have about five years of information with 30 to 40 percent of patients doing well. The combination treatment, there's between 60 to 70 percent, but a caution, that's three years. So we all think our immune systems have memory, and we all think that memory is something that will hold with a patient for the long term. But what I say is, is only the future has to tell. We have to keep working on our next step, regardless of where we are, though I'm really hopeful that a lot of this 60 to 70% of people that are doing well at three years, that it will be like IPI, that people doing well at three will be doing well at 10. We just don't know yet. So I don't know if that completely answers your question. I think there are people 
like I said, that will die of their heart attacks, strokes, or whatever we all go from. Um, we just have to work on figuring out who they are and how we can make that number bigger. Um, another question I get a lot is, so there's pembrolizumab or Keytruda, which is made by Merck, and there's nivolumab or um, Obdivo, which is made by BMS. I've worked with both drugs. The pembrolizumab's given every three weeks, the nivolumab's every two. I have yet to find a difference. I think really as far as shrinkage against your cancer, as far as side effects profile, they're really similar. I will kind of use the terms interchangeably. Of course, they've never been head to head because Merck and BMS are probably never gonna do that in their lives, but I don't know if it matters. Um, in my mind, I use them interchangeably. If I'm using the combination, I will stick with the Nevo because that's where the data is in the combination. I typically won't do like it be combined with pembrolizumab just because that hasn't been done. So I stick with what's been done when the studies, but overall, if you're choosing from one or the other, I don't think it personally matters. So the big question and something Dr. Grossman and I debate a little bit is, is, is two really better than one? Is doing that combination Ipinevo really better than doing just one? Because, and it really honestly depends who you ask. And I think the reason for that is where it's a risk benefit ratio, right? We have, we know that the combination gives more side effects. So is the additional shrinkage benefit worth those additional side effects? And this is a conversation I have with every one of my patients. And I personally, the combination has very impressive shrinkage of cancer quickly, which is not something we typically see in immune therapy. Um, this, at three years, some of the numbers are really impressive, some of the best we've seen in any of our new treatments that have come along. But some of the long-term si stuff is not known yet. It hasn't been that long since it just came out in phase one studies till it's out in the market now. And I always caution people at this because we don't know some of that long-term side effects. Could sequencing things be just as good is another thing that's a little unknown. Doing PD-1 first and doing IPI later, if we can use all these drugs in sequence and get the same outcome with less side effects in the long term, it might be just as good. Can we do try just one and only if it doesn't work, go to two? So we're not taking risk in everybody. Um, I know that's being done, the true percentage of how much better that is in second, again, unknown. I mention all these unknowns because I think in this era where we've had so many new therapies, sometimes people think clinical trials aren't till the end. I've had to go through everything. But as you can see here, there's a lot of questions that I don't have answers for you guys. And I think that's where clinical trials, even in the beginning of your treatment process, is still an important thing to consider. So another question that comes up is that biomarker. Can I use this PDL1? Can I take your tissue and stain for this and say, okay, you know, this is what you have. You have a lot of PDL1. We can just use one drug. We don't have to use two. Or we can predict you're definitely going to do well from, from these drugs. So originally we thought we had a home run here when we first discovered this, but ultimately my answer is no to this question. And the primary reason are there's people whose cancer comes back PDL1 negative that can respond to these drugs, and there's people that come back PDL1 positive and don't respond to these drugs. So it's not a hundred percent clear marker. And it's really inconsistent. So researchers in our lab can take one biopsy specimen from, from a cancer cell and slice it one way and get a negative result, look at a little different side of the biopsy and get a positive result. And I think that's something that's variable. And people are starting to say, maybe I should use this because I do think people that are truly pdl one positive probably respond higher rates to just one drug. But I think it's just early, and we're trying to answer these questions now. A lot of the studies that were presented earlier are trying to use this and see how well we can use this. But I do think it's part of what decision making. I don't think it's the only thing, and I don't think you can just hang your hat on it, at least not yet. So we need to still do better. 
Another question I get asked is, is how much toxicity is acceptable? And I say that is something that I really have to know you as a patient, know your family, know your caregiver, to really understand where, where that line is for you. You know, because some people, even very young patients, will tell me, look, I, I don't want to risk being hospitalized. I, you know, this has made me realize that life is short, and I want to climb and ski and do everything. I don't want to take any risk. And some say, you know, I don't care how risky this is. I want to make sure I do everything. So what I say is this is a conversation you need to have with your physician, with your family, and, and know what resources you have. Um, I think that um, if you're in a location where a hospital is a very far trip, you really need to think about that. Because if you get sick, you may not have the resources available to do that. Or if you live by yourself and you have not a lot of people around you. I think that's something that should go into that conversation of how much toxicity is okay. Um, for me, I, stage is a big determination. We were just talking a little bit about, you know, the less stage, the less risk that the melanoma is going to cause your problem. So to me, in those cases, you know, I personally don't want to take someone that our surgeons have already cured and give them a lifelong illness that, like diabetes or something, that, that really changes their outcomes. So to me, the more likely you are to be cured without these things, the less likely I want to give you things with toxicity. So the other thing we use a lot is something we coin as performance status, which is just how functional we are before we've even started anything. So are we able to eat, drink, go to the grocery store, go skiing? Are we able to work full time? Or do we have really bad heart failure and just regular activities are, are limiting for us? Because I think that's really important to know and it's really important for you as a patient to give your physician an accurate idea. Because I find that whatever people tell me is probably 10 times better. <laughs> Usually I have to look to the wife. The wife usually gives me a pretty good assessment of what's really going on. But, um, you know, I think that's important because that determines if you do get a side effect, are you going to recover back to what you normally are? We're all not five years old anymore. Where we get the flu, we're in bed, and the next day we're running on the playground. It all takes a certain amount of recovery to happen to get back to where we were. And so I think the sicker you are from whatever other medical things or things that are going on in our lives, the harder it is to kind of get back to where we were before. And so I think for me, that's a big determining factor of whether to do two and take the risk or whether not to is because I want to know that no matter what I do, that I'm able to keep people living their lives and living their lives the way they want to. So another way to your question, this is probably one of mine, is are we creating a new set of chronic diseases? And you know, like I said, some of these things are, are rare but occur. And these rare things are like the diabetes, the thyroid disease, things that I think, OK, I can replace you with pills. I say as a physician, I tend to just want to fight cancer, right? And I tend to take all these other medical problems and say, you know, Whatever, we don't have cancer, we've got to look at this as we're, we're, we're fighting the battle that we have today. Um, but it's something we should think about. And it's something we should think about because um, I went to a lecture once, and it was on a totally different hematologic disease. And they said, we always thought people just got it and then recovered fully as physicians. And this is with TTP. <laughs> and then they did all these surveys of patients and found out actually, they report a lot of different changes. And I think that's something that we're going to have to study more. Because the good news is, is there are more and more people with, that are living with melanoma or surviving melanoma. And so these are questions and feedback, I think, as you give your doctors this feedback. It's a whole other area of research to study like how much this is affecting you in your life and what we can do to mitigate that to make sure people are doing everything they want to do with their lives. 
So in switching gears, where do BRAF inhibitors fit in? So those are the dibrafenib, trametinib, um, someone's going to have to help me with the brand names, mechanist, telfenar, vemurafenib, help me with the brand names. Kobe, metinib, so all these different drugs that, that are out there, um, where do they fit in? Because my talk was on immune therapy, but there's a lot of people that benefit from BRAF. At least in Georgia, it seems like all of a sudden, all my patients are like, I don't want those drugs. Everyone comes resistant. I want the Jimmy Carter cure is what I get a lot. <laughs> but honestly, the first studies show about 30% of people at five years still on the drug, still doing well. There is a trial that's ongoing now that's looking at which one do you start with and can you just switch to another one? Is it better to start with immune or with these BRAF inhibitors? Again, these are only for patients whose cancer has that gene change in their cancer. My vote says it's going to be a wash, but the truth is, is I don't know. And uh, that's why these studies are so important so we can answer some of these questions. What about some of our other therapies? I think this already came up with where, where does surgery fit in now? My favorite thing and thing I talked to Dr. Keith Delman's our surgeon at Emory is I got a CT report back after I treated a patient and it said surgical resection of cancer. I've never been so excited in my life. I'm like, I'm putting you out of business. You don't need surgeons anymore. But the truth is in stage three disease, they still cure very many people with stage three melanoma. It can be used to improve symptoms. And perhaps there's more and more studies looking at how radiation can actually help the immune system work better. And I think something you mentioned before is that consolidation of immune therapy, that there's a lot of people, maybe they get shrinkage of everything, or if it's just one area that's resistant, can we use surgery in combination with these treatments to really improve outcomes? So I think we're looking at surgery differently, but I think it's still a, a portion of what we do and a part of our treatment. And the same is true for radiation. I think we're using it differently, but it, it's still an important part of what we do. Um, the big question that always occurs is, is what do we do when all these great advances don't work? And, and that is the hardest thing we see in our clinic is, is really, you know, the press is all really good and everyone goes into melanoma with a different outlook than I say they did 10 years ago. But sometimes all that is not enough. And I think trials are really, really important in this setting because we always need more options. And there's always going to be a percentage that we're not doing the best for that we need to work harder to do. I really strongly encourage people to consider other modalities of treatment along with their therapy, be it surgery, radiation, adding in TVEC, looking at novel combinations of things when you're kind of having to look outside the box. That's why I do think multidisciplinary care, meaning having your medical oncologist, your surgeon, your radiation doctor, all working as part of the team is really important in the care of melanoma, especially um, when things aren't working the way we want it to. I say, don't forget about the oldies. <laughs> you know, hydocyl 2 people don't really talk about much anymore. It's pretty toxic therapy um, that we don't do much. But there's no reason we need to lose that 5% of people that did quite well in it. And, and especially for some of our younger patients, it may still be an option. And maybe it will work better in people that have already been exposed to these other immune therapies. We don't know that. Even chemotherapy. I feel like chemotherapy is a bad word in my clinic. I like not to use it. I love when my breast cancer patients or doctors come to me with their chemo orders, and I'm like, what are you, in the 1990s? Do you still do this? And, but there are still people that respond to this drug. And I actually had a patient who was on the trial that got a lot of press. It was between the pembrolizumab and decarbazine because decarbazine was a chemo, it was the only thing we had at the time. He got decarbazine and he said how he was almost in tears when he found that out. And what that trial was how many years ago now? And he's still hanging out on his decarbazine and, and doing really, really well. So really understanding that, that sometimes there's still options and, 
And whether that's right for you or whether that toxicity right is right for you is important for you to um, discuss with your doctor. So there's a lot of different immune therapies. There's different checkpoints and molecules that we're finding to um, augment our immune system. So just like all these drugs started and nobody knew anything, I, I know that some of these other agents that are in studies now are really looking to hopefully even revolutionize what we have now. There's a study called the MATCH study that's a really interesting study where they're actually biopsying people's cancer, re-looking at the genes after therapy to seeing if we can match drugs to, to the abnormalities there, and really new combination studies, understanding why cancers are resistant to these therapies and moving forward. So there's a lot in the future. There's a, a lot to look at. And what I like to say is I still think the future is bright. Um, and that we're doing better every day. These are my kids, so I always have to bring them up. Um, and they're the reasons, and they're the reason a lot of people do clinical trials and a lot of people drive miles or fly in to seek something new. It's because we're all looking to the next generation and how are we going to um, make the world better for them and decrease melanoma getting melanoma to begin with, so, and, and to hopefully, even if you have it, that it becomes more of a chronic illness than a something that people look at um, and fear the worst. And I think that's all I have. I'm sorry, I think I talked a really long time. That's mm. That was fantastic. Um,